Dueling Dialogues is brought to you by our affiliates at IX Web Hosting. Click the banner on the right left chronicles.com to get up to 40% off your first year of the best hosting on the planet. Today's episode of Dueling Dialogue is brought to you by Saucy Eva. Gma's marinade is coming soon to a plate near you to gourmetize your meats and proteins. Coming to you from that once forgotten artery that pulses through the center of the continental United States and into the heart of the Ozarks, Grace Matthews. Looking in from the northern border, our Canadian friend, along with his countrymen feeling the effects of U.S. political issues, Connor Murphy. Welcome to episode one of Dueling Dialogues. I'm Connor Murphy in the studio with Grace Matthews. Hi, Grace. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. This is a bit different. We're not, uh, we're not typing. That's right. Hopefully it works out well. Yes. Yes. I'm kind of uh, enjoying this. It's been fun so far. So hopefully uh, we'll have a lot more podcasts coming down the pipe. That's the plan. Okay. All right. What do you got for us today, Grace? So today we are going to discuss Republicans and Democrats. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. And the impeachment of Trump. Okay. That's on at least half the world's mind all the time. It has been on mine for uh, about a year, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the tarmac meeting between Loretta Lynch and former President Bill Clinton. Sounds juicy. And, and Sinclair TV's pursuit of Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. All right. Okay, I'm looking forward to that one as well. Well, as we hinted earlier... Republicans and Democrats have a common enemy, Trump. Yeah, he's a walking target. For sure. And on both sides, too. Right. And in a strange way, he's making a target out of the Congress and the Senate, at least the Republican side. Which I wouldn't think was a very good idea. No, it's not a very good idea. But can you imagine being Rona McDaniel and needing to raise money for the midterm elections for the Senate and the Congress? No, not when, uh, you know, a lot of your own party members are, are you know, boycotting Trump and wanting to see him impeached. So I would not want that as a job. Um, yeah, that, that, you can pay me enough. Well, health care has to be fixed. Now, does it have to be repealed and repaired or re- repealed and replaced or... Can it just be repaired? I don't think any of us out here in the real world care. What we do care about is that the this has to be done before people are laying in hospitals dying. I'm actually sure that that's already started to happen. Oh, I agree with you. I Um, I agree. You guys have a big challenge um, there, and that is because your hospitals and a lot so many of your health services are privatized, which allows people to set their own pay structure. And that's why your, your healthcare is so overly inflated. It's, it's, you know, the same principle of selling the army a $2 hammer for 12 bucks that went on in the seventies, that big scandal, the same thing's happening to healthcare. And in Canada, we have healthcare. We're able to control the cost because the government owns the hospitals and runs the hospitals are not privately owned. So it's easy for us to tweak little things in healthcare and, and make it better as time changes, if things move on, we just tweak it into place and, and make it better. Um, but the, hey, let's start again method of doing things, I, I think that there has to be some big change in, in uh, setting prices that for healthcare services that has to happen in your country before any kind of healthcare is even possible. But that's socialized medicine. And is, and then, is there anything wrong with that? It's giving the government an awful lot of power. But the government pays for our health care in Canada. You don't have crazy bills when we get sick. If I get sick, I go to the hospital. I don't get a bill. But what, what about when a person gets very sick or very old? Does the government decide they shouldn't have care? Like what happened to baby Charlie in the UK? When you get too sick or too old in Canada, who decides when medical treatment is ceased? Treatment doesn't stop. Um, 
if you get that sick, you move to palliative care, which is still paid for health care. So, and you can even arrange basically if you want to die at home. So we also have assisted suicide here in Canada. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. But I think the people in the United States right now are pretty focused on this baby in the UK, baby Charlie. And the fact that the state, the government decided when Charlie would die. Well, and we're not used to those kinds of decision being in the hands of any government. I mean, it, they, they can't cover every cost for every single person. It's not, you're not going to make everybody happy. There's going to be people that fall through the cracks. And in this case, chances are the baby would have never survived. So that's the way they're looking at it. Is it maybe if there was a, a case before it where, you know, this procedure worked, I can see them, you know, paying for it approving that occasionally that happens with a very rare disease or, or something to somebody in Canada and usually what happens is they um, do like a GoFundMe page and family friends total strangers corporations donate money and they make it happen that's excellent in the perfect world but this is the fear that Americans have about socialized single-payer medicine well, there's a lot of myths around that as well. And I think Trump is actually guilty of, of some of those myths because I remember when he was campaigning, he was taking shots at Canadian health care. And uh, everything he was saying was totally not true. It was unfounded, which is kind of the norm. But um, yeah, he, he you know pissed off a lot of Canadians when he started slugging our health care. And yet, look at what's going on now south of the border. You guys are in a real bind and people are dying. Oh, we are in a real bind. In fact, there are many counties that have no health care. Exactly. They have they do not have companies that will write health care for their particular region. And when everyone is signing up this coming December, how's that gonna play out? If 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 Congress and in this case the Senate cannot get health care passed. Mitch McConnell needs to step down if he can't handle the job. He couldn't even convince John McCain to not throw the vote in this last in this last vote. John McCain has every reason to hate or be angry with Donald Trump for things he said during the election process. <laughs> but He's Mitch McConnell should have been able to talk him into voting to repeal the health care bill, and he wasn't able to do so. Yeah, that's a big problem. You know, It is a big problem. And to go back to where we started in this conversation, I know that when I'm sent envelopes and emails about giving money to the RNC, I'm angered because I'm not going to give one dime till they can take care of tax reform, and healthcare. Those yeah. are the two things we the people wanted. Yeah, and and you know what? It's it, it would be just like burning. You might as well just burn your money. They got to show you something first. I mean, right. Either that or split the fund into okay, this is a fund for the old guys. If you want to keep them, and here's a fund for new guys. We're going to have some new candidates. It's a, it's it, it. It doesn't give me much confidence at all that. They're going to pull it off. I, I don't have to. Only 12 days for the rest of the year will the Congress and the Senate be in session at the same time. Now, they've got to pass a budget, um, which the government shuts down October 1st if they don't get this budget passed. And that's not a sure deal right now. And health care and tax reform and infrastructure. And then, of course, the infamous wall. <laughs> All of those things are on the agenda and they can't they can't seem to get one of those things passed in the last seven months since Trump took office. Yeah, and that's probably partially the fault of their own party. I mean, it, it's the equivalent of a mother eating her own young. Well, let's face it, back to the original idea, Republicans and Democrats have a common enemy, Trump. Yes. They're constantly 
spending a lot of time on the idea of his impeachment. Exactly. Instead of progressing the com- the country forward. Exactly. And Charles Krauthammer, a syndicated columnist, very well respected, a Fox News contributor, made a statement that I think is spot on. Uh, this comes from The Observer. Krauthammer predicted that if Trump is impeached and removed from office, it may cause a backlash from the kind of people roaring for him in West Virginia. Although they may be only 33% of the population, this many people can make a mighty fuss. That's why I think we're really headed into very choppy and dangerous constitutional water, Krauthammer said. It would be a catastrophic mistake. It would cause a rupture in the country where people would say, when we the people, the ones who have been abandoned, elect somebody we like, other guy, our guy gets taken out. And these people are very committed to Trump. These people that go to his rallies, they're not just the people that voted for Trump. These are the people that have, like Krauthammer said, become his army. So if there is an impeachment process, I think what Krauthammer is saying is it better be worth it because the damage it will do to this country could be catastrophic. These people seriously believe that we have had many presidencies that have overlooked their needs. How do you see it from up there? People are just fed up. They, they want change. And yeah, I uh, honestly, I, I see the country being more divided and more divided. Uh, if I look back on the last two years, I, I see a bigger split. And if you go to any bigger city in the, in the United States right now, what are you going to see? Common uh, riot. There is protests going on all the time, much exactly. like the 60s. You bet. The Observer goes on further, explaining that Krauthammer put the circumstances of Trump's speech in the context of the investigation of Trump's circle and its possible involvement in the Russian espionage scandal in last year's election. He did not use the word demagogue. He didn't have to. The whole speech was Russia closing in on me in Washington versus you the people. Krauthammer said that's how he set it up. He is very good at this. He's speaking of his of his rally in West Virginia this past week. He's talking about how Trump is rallying his followers against the Russian collusion without saying that, you know. Well, this is not the first time the country's been through an impeachment process. It's never good for the country. Never. No. No. And the last time was our best friend, Bill Clinton. Exactly. And was that really worth it? No. I mean, uh, it was a whole joke to begin with. I mean, any guy that says he didn't inhale or didn't inhale and, uh, you know, he's lying. So yeah, his- what was his testimony worth? Nothing. Once a liar, always depends a liar. On, depends on what is is. <laughs> Yeah, which it, it's interesting that, I mean, he's still really involved in all of this scandalous election time. Yeah, he's he's still pulling tricks behind the scenes. <laughs> this this week, him and uh, Loretta Lynch's tarmac meeting came to light again, according to the Daily Caller, um, a story written by Chuck Ra- Ross who I believe broke the story, claims several of Lynch's emails were included in 413 pages of DOJ documents provided to the conservative groups Judicial Watch and the American Center for Law and Justice. Both groups had filed lawsuits for records regarding Lynch's controversial meeting with President Bill Clinton at the Phoenix airport last June 27th which happened to be the day before Hillary Clinton's testimony to the FBI. Now, if you will also remember, um, James Comey, the former FBI director, was asked about this several times and claimed there were no emails or documents 
pertaining to the tarmac meeting. Now, apparently the tarmac meeting was planned. Emails confirm this. I don't think you write, you write emails and have security coordinate to talk about golf and grandchildren. You are correct. I mean, it is in election time. They, there's only one reason that they were meeting. I mean, well, and Hillary was really under the gun at that point. Exactly, she, she was starting to lose ground, and panic was starting to set in. Right, and the email scandal could have gone either way. And uh, when James Comey came out with the statement that sort of excused her, but not exactly, um, you have to wonder what kind of influence this meeting on the tarmac had well, in okay. Comey's final decision. First of all, meeting on a tarmac, that can't be good, ever. No. You know, there, yeah. there's something shady going on there. Who meets on a tarmac? Oh, excuse me, i got to go meet my friend today. We're meeting on the tarmac. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Most people, most of us meet over coffee. It, yeah, coffee. And, and that's when we talk about grandchildren. We don't do that on the tarmac. But um, it was also revealed that, um, that Loretta Lynch uses a pseudonym, Elizabeth Carlisle, which is supposedly her grandmother's her grandmother's name. She uses this um, pseudonym to um, send out emails. Um, there was a lot of excitement about that. I, I don't believe that's exciting at all. I think a lot of people in possession do use pseudonyms. Mm. Yeah, I, right. I don't think that's anything all that, that interesting. Yeah, especially when you're, you're writing sensitive information about you know, things like politics, it, uh, it could rile some people. Not everybody's going to like what you're saying all the time and you're going to have enemies out there. So media uses pseudonyms, pen names. Exactly. And media is right in the middle of the news itself. You <laughs> yeah. know, the, Always uh, is now, lately. Ah, for sure. Sinclair Media is pursuing none other than Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. Not surprising at all. Not only are they pursuing them, they're looking to expand their network hmm. by um, purchasing for $3.9 billion Tribune Media. If, they, if this sale goes through and is approved, they will have a larger broadcast footprint than Fox News. This will include several network stations in in different markets. Wow, that's a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. You know, Fox News possibly should not, from a financial standpoint, have been so quick to part ways with their talent. Yeah, totally on the same page there. I mean, O'Reilly was a huge draw. He was Fox News. And to let him go for something that he supposedly did a long time ago, um, questionable. I think it's very questionable. I mean, if he did it, and certainly they paid off some women, there's certainly an interesting argument to the fact that he wasn't guilty and did not want to go to court. I, I, in a way, understand that. Regardless, if he was guilty in 2006 and 2008, he should have been fired then. Yeah, he was you still too wait. big of a draw. Yeah, he was too you big of a draw. He was. But you don't wait till the New York Times writes an article focusing on this $13 million that was paid to several women more than five years ago. Hmm. You don't... You don't fold under that kind of pressure. Yeah, you're essentially allowing your advertisers to dictate your content. And you're allowing others to boycott your your advertisers. And I believe they had the money to to withstand this kind of pressure. Because you gotta remember a cable network also has subscriptions. And oftentimes their news network 
because of the subscriptions and the advertising, has had more money to work with than than some of the network channels. Right. Exactly. Two two um, legs to their marketing. Exactly. You know, which is different than the way we perceived cable even a decade ago. They were always the underdogs with little less money. Their sets didn't look as great. Um, now you look at uh, some of the cable news sets and the money they spend on gathering news, and it's far greater than the networks because they also have the subscriptions. They have that to lie on. That's their padding, their residual income. Now, at the same time, Sinclair is pursuing Bill, Ro- Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. Bill O'Reilly has agreed to go on CNN next month. Hey, that's really surprising. To do what? I don't know. Yeah, but to maybe that's about, the whole idea. Everybody's exactly. going to be wondering, what is this about? And they're going to tune in. So it's it's a pretty, pretty brilliant move by CNN, which is surprising on its own. <laughs> it is a brilliant move because they have like very few viewers. Yes, and less and less they're, all the time. Usually when I need a good laugh, I turn on CNN. (laughs) Exactly. Well, and just this week, O'Reilly went from audio podcast to a video podcast. And none other than a CNN contributor was there um, on the air with him, assisting him in this transition. So I don't think you can minimize this appearance or appearances on CNN by Bill O'Reilly. You know, they were very much involved in the boycott of advertisers um, for his show back in April, along with MSNBC. Right now that he's out there, and I'm pretty sure his non-compete is probably getting ready to expire, they would sign him. Wow, that that's Pretty big. And I mean, basically, it's the same theory when you want to win a war, you divide and conquer. So all the other media jump in, divide Bill O'Reilly from Fox, and then they jump in and conquer, and they're going to scoop him. So that's my take on that. Can you believe the, the Murdoch family of Fox keeps falling for this? It makes you wonder, like, they kind of messed up, and now they're still messing up. Um, and I don't know why. It's shocking. And in our next episode, we're going to explore that more. Okay. The, um, the other victims of the war against Fox news. We need equalize more equalization of our, our media in order to, to be offered a unbiased look at the news. And right now that's not happening. And throw, exactly. Throw fake news in there, and it's an ugly, ugly mix. You don't know what to believe. You don't know who to believe, and maybe that's part of the whole strategy. It it, it seems like it is part of the strategy. Hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what we can dig up in the future. Oh, I think it's pretty good. Awesome. Pretty juicy, as you say. Pretty juicy. And right. for people like us, it matters. Yeah. We, we want the advertisers to stay in the game. You bet. You bet. It's uh, it's bread and butter. So I, I understand the importance, but uh, there's always another advertiser out there. So I don't get dictating the, the advertisers dictating the content of the show. I get it. You don't want your brand uh, associated with certain content. I get that part. But uh, I just don't get... What Fox did with O'Reilly, I don't understand. And I think it was a huge mistake. Agreed. Hey. We don't always agree, Connor, but uh, well, every now and then we do. We agree to disagree more than we agree. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Do we have anything else today? Looking That's like, it for today. Looking like it's time. All right. Thank you, all the listeners out there. And uh, we look forward to... Uh, having you join us again on episode two, which should be coming up uh, in the next few days. So take care, Grace. Have a good weekend. You too, Connor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dueling Dialogues is brought to you by our affiliates at IX Web Hosting. 
Click the banner on the right left chronicles.com to get up to 40% off your first year of the best hosting on the planet. Today's episode of Dueling Dialogue is brought to you by Saucy Eva. Gma's marinade is coming soon to a plate near you to gourmetize your meats and proteins. <laughs> 